the Advisory Literacy Program hosting this workshop. Um, we have a couple more workshops coming up. We have funding unpaid internships uh, at the Colley Career Center on Wednesday, November 1st at 5 p.m. Uh, then there is Dress for Success on a Budget, which we will have a short presentation on how to dress in the workplace after college. And then afterwards, you'll be able to pick out one outfit from our collected, um, gently used workplace clothing items. Uh, so please come back to that as well. That is on November 9th at 6 p.m. And uh, you can check our Facebook and Twitter for the exact locations. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet going around to sign up for our listserv. You know, get regular updates on our workshops as well as surveys for raffles and other things like that. Um, and so today we're doing a study abroad on a budget with the study abroad office, also known as Office of Global Education with Annette Russell. So she'll be handling the first half and then I'll jump in. Then we have our um, former, former study abroadies, attorneys, who are here to also tell about their experiences. And we'll have questions at the end, but feel free to speak out throughout if something's confusing or you want to learn more. So. Hi everybody, nice to see so many um, my name is Annette. I'm a global education advisor in OGE, the Office of Global Education. And I'm in charge of the entire Asia Pacific region. So, all of Asia, in case you're interested, plus Australia, New Zealand, and very randomly, one country in the Middle East, Israel. Um, they're advisors for other regions as well, so you may end up talking to a number of people when you're thinking about studying abroad. I'm going to mention that I'm joined here by Daniela, who was my um, student who went to India, and she's going to tell us about her experience later. We're really happy to have her here. Um, and thank you guys for coming. I definitely like it when you interrupt me or ask questions, because I don't like to hear myself talk all the time. In any case, we're going to start off with a broad overview of what Georgetown does uh, for students in terms of study abroad. And the really good news is that Georgetown wants you to study abroad. So it's one of the few times I say that Georgetown is good about finances. You know, there's so many times when you're like, hey. but actually, um, in, in theory, you're supposed to be fully funded for study abroad if you're on financial aid. And it carries with you for semester programs. It's a little bit harder for summer programs because it doesn't automatically uh, carry with you. So for those, we'll talk about some of the scholarship opportunities you might have. Uh, just a little bit later. Then um, we have just started actually a very exciting new program, so I hope maybe some of you will want to come. On Friday, November 17th, I got the date this morning, OGE is going to sponsor a passport day. So if you've never had a passport before, you can come uh, on that day to our office. There'll be a State Department representative, there'll be an OGE person with a credit card. You can fill out the application right then and there and have us swipe you in and you can get a free passport. And even if you're not even sure you're going to study abroad, it's valid for 10 years and you'll have that document always. And you'll have so many options then in case you decide to go abroad. So that will be advertised on our website pretty soon, um, studyabroad.georgetown.edu, which is there. And um, there, I think you'll be blasted probably with the message as well. Oh, Question. Sorry. You yeah. probably already said where it was. Um, where that was going to be. <coughs> or the, the passport thing. What office? Oh, it will be the Office of Global Education. We're located in the car barn, which I always call the fringe of campus mm -hmm. because it's like as far away as you can get from real life, real student life. But um, if you have any questions about that, I also, I'll leave my card up here. So any. Question, follow-up questions you might have about anything I say, you're welcome to email me at any time or call me or Skype me. Um, let's see, where are we now? So we'll have that, and then um, all of the advisors in our office who would work with you closely on any kind of study abroad program you would ever see are, are, well, are, are open to talking about budgeting because it's a really, really important topic. You know, there are the expected standard costs of study abroad, and then there are things that might surprise you that you never thought about if you just haven't traveled before. And I'm hopeful that maybe Daniela can talk about some of those, or Charlotte who will be coming uh, a little bit later, and she was doing a summer program. So if you have concerns, please always feel free to reach out. Even if I'm not the regional advisor, you can start with me and I can direct you to others or just talk about funding. So for semester programs, there are six costs and they are, what do you know, the biggest cost is going to be Georgetown tuition. You're going to remain a Georgetown student while you're studying abroad, so 
you'll be paying that. And then we have a, a really great study abroad insurance that you can tell your family about to reassure them. It costs $60 per trimester, so for every four month period. And so your program might cost $60, it might cost $120 if it crosses some you know, date lines. And if you're gone for a full year, it could be $210. But that insurance covers um, medical evacuation, security evacuation, and your primary health costs. So it's really, really great insurance. The thing that's tricky then is that for every program we have, we probably have over 150 programs now, the other, other costs are going to be variable. Like your housing might be cheap in Hong Kong. One of my programs is $1,000. But it might be really expensive in Australia, where it could cost seven or eight thousand um, dollars. And then passport and visa. That hopefully you're getting your passport free. But a visa can be a, a variable cost. To find it. it might cost one hundred forty dollars. To Australia, it might be four hundred fifty dollars. And to New Zealand, it might be free. So it really depends on the program you're going on. Um, but in a further slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how financial aid covers you for those varied costs as well. Then the round trip airline ticket's going to be different depending on where you go. And the cost of living in the location, cost of local transportation will vary. And the miscellaneous costs, you know you're always going to spend money on something or other. There's, there's always going to be something intriguing or some daily costs. And we'll talk a little bit more about those a little bit later. So that's it in a nutshell, what a semester program costs, very generally. And then costs for summer programs are usually almost entirely fixed. <coughs> like when you go and look at a summer program on our website, it will say, you want to go to Georgetown and Rome? It costs $4,400. And then you want to go to, amazingly, a program in Amman, Jordan can cost $12,000. One might have three credits, might, one might get 12 credits, one might be three weeks, one might be you know, 10 weeks. So there are all kinds of variables in that sense. Um, and then there's a standard $60 study abroad fee. So when you go to the website, you'll basically see the program costs, and the thing you have to add is going to be your airline ticket, which will be something extra for you and possibly some meals. Any questions so far? And, oh yay, some, some new names appeared here. So what does financial aid cover? Um, basically, financial aid is really good about <coughs> study abroad. They want to keep your cost approximately the same as what you'd be paying on campus based on what you can afford. So if you're going to study abroad in a more expensive location, they're going to up your aid. And then if you're going to and then standard, it's usually a pretty standard fee at the bottom because you're still paying Georgetown tuition. So that's one of the most expensive things. And Kelly, right? If you have anything to, she's from the financial aid office. I just met her. She's I'm Trudy. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> she's a good contact for all of us. Um, and then um, for every program we have that we send students to, we have an estimated budget online. And on the estimated part, we do include estimated airline costs, estimated meals, estimated <coughs> um, and And so you'll really have a good sense there of what goes through your Georgetown account and what goes through what you're going to pay directly. But in any case, say, for example, that you go to Australia and you have to pay housing costs directly there and they're again, like seven or $8,000. Financial aid office will account for that seven or $8,000 and, and then put it in your budget, basically in your account, and before the semester starts, you have to request it to come to you and, and you know, right, those funds to, into your bank account, and then you pay directly in Australia. So you are going to get those funds somehow. Now the tricky thing with some programs is that the dates they start might be different from the date that Georgetown starts. Again, I'm using all these examples from my region, but in Australia they have really funky calendar dates. So instead of fall semester being September through December, you're going mid-July to late November. And with financial aid, your financial aid isn't going to be released until the start of Georgetown semester, which is way too late for you to pay your housing and buy your airline ticket, etc. So in those cases, I work closely with a student. I you know, direct them to the financial aid office. 
I document that you need funds early, and then those are released to <coughs> Earth. So the important thing to know is never to uh, worry about asking for things. You know, in a case like that, if somebody forgets to tell you, well, you're going to have to pay this housing deposit, and you think, well, I don't have a housing deposit money yet, then say that to somebody, and especially in your office, I guess. <coughs> Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. I guess you'll know who your financial aid counselor is. Um, the, the great thing in the global education community, it's really an exciting development, and it changes almost daily, I feel, is that everybody's trying to raise money for scholarships. Practically everybody. All the so-called study abroad providers, these are organizations we use to send students to certain places. They are giving out scholarships, and the government's giving out scholarships. Even, um, even some funky scholarships happen, like um, I'll show you this one that's pretty new. The Israeli embassy came to us, and they said, we'd like to give out scholarships to Hispanic students to go to Israel. And we said, mm-hmm, because we thought, well, how many students are thinking about going to Israel? Well, we posted it on our website, and I have two students going to Israel in the spring with scholarship money. So you can be amazed at what kind of um, sources you can find scholarships. We do have a, a funding page. You can actually say it. Studyabroad.georgeson.eu. If you go to our website, you'll, you'll find it pretty easily, I think. And it lists most of the primary scholarships and funding sources. But I'd say that for wherever you decide to go, there, there's often some kind of scholarship available. The one um, caveat I'll say to that is that sometimes scholarships can be a little tricky because if you've maxed out on aid and then you get this brilliant scholarship, it's possible that your aid here might be reduced, right? It's, it's very kind of tricky situation, but we always try to have a, a scholarships to replace loans or go towards airline ticket or something extra. And that's what the study abroad organizations are thinking about, too. They're, said they're giving out lots of scholarships now for directly to students for airline travel or other things. Any questions? Um, so I hope that what you, well, actually, I didn't really talk about many of the scholarships. And I should point out that I have uh, a lot of the flyers here for you. And there's some scholarships that uh, students get every semester. For example, the Gilman Scholarship, which is available only to Pell recipients. <coughs> we, we regularly have, I think, I'd say probably five or 10 students who get these. There's also a critical language scholarship that has a, a flyer here, and it's for, for study in the summertime. That's especially good um, when, you're, when you're studying a language that that would be helpful to. <coughs> the U.S., you know, <coughs> unique languages that um, we in America need to learn more about, you know, it could be Asian languages or Middle Eastern languages, and, and there's a list of them there. There are also boring fellowships, those can be even for full year study, those are pretty competitive, so if you were interested in one of those, you would work with the GOFAR office, the fellowship office here on campus. They actually help review your essay, they tie it in with the professor to look it over, and they give you a lot of support if you're applying for something like that. The other ones, when I mentioned providers, those acronyms aren't going to mean anything to you, but they're some of the main organizations we use. We send a lot of students on CIEE programs, that's what Danielle went on, uh, Council on International Education Exchange. We send a lot of students all over the world. And then IES, uh, CT, SIT, School for International Training, they are all offering lots of scholarships. Any questions? So I hope what you uh, learned from that previous part is that the good news is that Georgetown really does try to support you who study abroad with scholarship opportunities and finances. Um, and that uh, also, in some places, part-time work is legal. So if you want extra pocket money for traveling or for just you know, keeping up with the cafe costs or something, 
places like Australia, I have a lot of students or a couple every semester who get a part-time job. The visa that you buy for Australia is very expensive, but once you have it, you have a work permit where you could work up to 20 hours every week, 40 hours every two weeks. Now, that doesn't mean you have to work because, in theory, you're covered by your financial aid, but it gives you an opportunity to possibly integrate into the culture, meet more local people, and do something fun. I've also had students work in Japan because that's also allowed now on the visa. And then, of course, there's some countries where you're not allowed to work at all, so you have to be really careful with the regulations if you want to work somewhere where it was legal. So, the good news is the basic costs that we went through earlier, they're mostly covered in study abroad, but the bad news is that there are going to be all kinds of surprise costs that you might not have thought of, and that's where I think we're going to look to Melissa to tell us about her experience, and also Daniela, and I have Charlotte's coming at 5.30. I kind of raced through that too much. No questions? No questions. Um, for the work study part, can you just explain more about that? Oh, yeah, I didn't really mention that, did I? Because you can't work study when you're abroad, your aid is up. I mean, they account for the fact that you would have done work study here, so you're getting more funds. So anything you can't do here, um, they're taking that into account. Uh, can you apply to CLS if you're going to graduate in May? Um, I think you can, but I'm not sure. And I could follow up with you if you wanted to leave me your information or if you want to look at the website. Yeah, yeah I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I think so, but I can't say for sure. All right, thank you. All right. So my experience is I studied in Paris for a summer food beauty program. I studied in Berlin for eight months uh, through Georgetown as well, and then I did an independent study abroad in Bordeaux, France, after I graduated, where I studied a, a master's level of French language. So, lots of different experiences, including the one which was with the university and not with the university. Um, I recommend you go with the university because not being an independent student studying abroad means you lose a lot of protections, and a lot of people are willing to help you because you're doing everything on your own. Um, so, surprise costs that I ran into a lot. So in my Paris study abroad, I luckily had a homestay, so I didn't need, didn't need to buy flour or salt or pepper or, pepper or oil or anything. Um, for my Bordeaux study abroad, I moved into an empty house, and there was nothing. And I didn't realize how much stuff was kind of in the pantry already. So some things to think about are what kind of living situation I'll be in, and um, what you might need for that. Um, weather dependent, if you're going to somewhere like the Middle East, that's significantly higher than where you are now you may need to completely change your wardrobe, or vice versa if you're going to Australia in the winter, Australia. Some are very cold in the winter. You don't have like very, very cold mm, in the winter. No, Berlin. China, hard in China. <laughs> Everybody's scared to go there. So if you're one of those brave souls who wants a real adventure, come back to that. Hard in China. It's close to the Russian border. And I was in uh, northern Germany during the winter, which was a fun experience for everyone. Um, I recommend it. But yeah, some things like that. Conversion cost for currency did come up a lot. Um, I was using euros. I noticed my bank withdrawal fees. Luckily, I used the Guascu, the, the Georgetown Credit Union, so it's one dollar per withdrawal. But I had some people that are paying like five percent each time, which, if you're using mostly cash, can really add up. Um, electronic cards for your power outlets of the, the different countries that you're going to, especially if you're traveling within Europe, you're going to have at least three or four different kind of plugs. Um, I can't speak to Asia or anything, but I'm sure they're also different. Kind of all over the world, you're having different plugs. Yeah. So um, you can get a kit. Yeah, I, I think I bought like a giant pack um, at like Best Buy or something all different kinds and all my friends just split it up depending on who's going where. Um, cell phone fees. This can be a big deal if you want to fully integrate over there so you don't have, for example, I have friends that said I never answer phone numbers outside of my country and I'm like, the American here is sad because I want to be friends because they often get a lot of spam calls. So if you want to buy a number in that country, that could really up your costs. There's contract fees. Um, if you are moving into a truly not integrated household, like not a homestay or renting an apartment, you may have to buy Wi-Fi on your own, though it might be contracted. So these kind of things just pop up that you really can't account for. Uh, can I say things? What's up? Um, so I was in Chile, and um, I bought a little phone chip, and it was like $5 a month to have like a local number, and then you can still talk with your family via Wi-Fi. So I definitely recommend that. 
And also, um, for your bank cards, make sure you notify your bank before you go, because I did not do that, and they shut down my card for a month, and I had to borrow from my friends. So make sure you notify your bank. <laughs> and um, also, for um, here in Europe, EasyJet is the kind of quick plane travel airline to use, but they're based in the UK, so I told them, give me France and Germany for my countries. And they're like, what's this recent UK purchase? It must be fraud. And I'm like, no, 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 sorry. That was my easy jet purchase to get from France to Germany. So watch these little things. Watch where the sources are for things, because they may be, especially for the country, if you're in an area with lots of different countries right around there, it might happen more often than not. So I would things? just add that with cell phones, I think in terms of my, in my region of all of Asia, it's very different if, if somebody, if there's a program there that you're on with a resident director, for example, they give you a lot of information about that kind of thing. If you're going straight into a university as a regular and director role student, then you have more independence. Mm -hmm. you know, you're doing more things on your own, but there's kind of a balance, so you'll figure that out when you're looking at programs. Mm -hmm. um, I used for my board of study abroad Google Fi, which was the Google's kind of network plan, and it was really, really cheap to call abroad. I didn't really had to worry about calling people back in the States or in other countries. Um, and some cell phone plans have kind of an international add-on you can buy as well. Um, so, there's that first one. Uh, with cell phone costs in your host country and compare whether it's worth buying if they want or just adding on to your Google or at and um, your bank beforehand. I, maybe other people in your program, especially if you're in a language department, ask if they still have their converters. They're probably just conducting dust somewhere. Um, maybe if there's a, like a Facebook group for your department or whatever, as opposed to like, I'm going to Chile, who has the converter, kind of borrow it, or just buy it off them. Um, look for, your scholar for scholarships through your department. So I got a scholarship for the Paris program. Um, this was back in 2012-13. Uh, I had to write an essay for it, I had to apply for it, but I did get it for the summer program, which offset about a third of my costs. Um, as for my German one, I wanted to do a German, an internship in Germany, which is not covered because I always covered for the semester by financial aid. But um, the German department um, found a scholarship for me that paid for my airfare, and I think it was my first couple of months right there. So that was really helpful. Um, and I used studentuniverse.com for flights. Uh, I think that got me at least $200 off my Paris flight, if I recall correctly. So I really recommend looking around for those kind of sites. And STA? I added, and I have a flyer for STA travel. I added it on a later slide. That's another place where you can get good, cheap airline tickets. It's supposed to be some of the best uh, prices for students. And also, they have generally low change fees. So if you don't know exactly what day you want to come back, you can buy a ticket and not have to pay that $250 or $300 fee. So that's a good thing. They also have a payment deposit program. So if your funds are tight and you want to buy a guaranteed ticket, you can put $300 down and, and you don't have to pay the rest till a week before you leave. So you can do that two months in advance and know you've got your ticket, which is, is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So this is just a sample of what I did in my Berlin study abroad. I'm sure I'm missing a few things. These are the bigger ones um, that came up. So my rent was for Berlin at the time. Now it's much more expensive. It was fairly cheap compared to DC. So it's kind of helpful that my Financial aid thought I was playing Georgetown prices when in fact I was playing Berlin prices. I did that offset some cash there. Uh, the metro is really cheap because Germany has a good investment in our tra transportation system. Um, food as well. A couple of things that surprised me. My intern visa was $280 and then I had to pay a student visa right after I got my intern visa. Um, so in order to earn money working my internship, that actually cost more than I earned per month. That, that's the intern visa. So sometimes the internships are just for the experience, they're not for the money. It's kind of what I experienced in Berlin. Um, I had to do lots of wiring costs because they're a little more antiquated at the internship company I was at where I had to wire them certain things and get wires back and that did cost me you know, 40 euros at one point. Um, and then I had to pay the internship match the company that got me that internship. Um, and I actually had to pay directly to Humboldt University for their, not really tuition fees, but like kind of class supporting fees, like um, student groups, which is 380 euros. So I was outside of my tuition, but I still needed to pay that to matriculate into Humboldt University. So those things just kind of kept popping up, and they were a little bit surprising. <laughs> um, again, oh, so um, the Corp, at least when I was at Georgetown, had a lot of scholarships for Ben Bolton writing essays, especially involving travel. They were just advertised them for about a month or so. And the fun fact is people don't like writing scholarship essays, but that means you win if you do. I've, I've, I've applied to three or four core scholarships and I won one of those because I was the only person who had written something, or at least I've written something decent worth reading. 
I really recommend you, whenever you see any kind of travel scholarship, write about how you wanted to travel there, or you did travel, want to travel again, how you want to use your studies, because people are really interested in those stories, and so people will actually put the work into those scholarships. Um, some, there are some paid internships abroad, and if you're really lucky, I've heard that the internship, internship company pays for your flight. So look into that when you're looking at internships. And um, I used HealthX.net, which is a work exchange program where I worked on an organic farm in Germany uh, for a couple of weeks. I did it in a vineyard in Bordeaux for a couple of weeks, kind of during the holiday times to offset costs. It was really great for my language skills. Um, they also have an English-speaking countries if you don't want to deal with the language barrier. I know England in particular is just wild with HealthX. Um, it's only like $30 to sign up for the website for the access to like message people and families and see if you'd like to work with them. Uh, it's not sponsored by George Shaw, so we'll put that out there. It's a separate website. I just happen to use an app so broad. It's kind of like what thing if you've ever heard of that. Okay. So, uh, Danielle, do you want to? Yeah. Um, so I went to India um, this past spring, and I did an independent fiction, so I was the first one to ever do this program in Hyderabad, India. Um, I am also a Georgetown Scholarship Program member, so I'm a GS peer, and I am like strongly dependent on my financial aid, um, which like most of what, like how I get through the semester is on my refund. Um, and my program began in December. I, I left the day after Christmas. Oh yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. That was yeah. That was earliest for spring. Yeah, it was really, really early. So like, I was, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do with my refund? Because my refund wasn't gonna hit till uh, Georgetown semester started. Um, and so we were able to work something out to where I could request it early, uh, but it, I still had to wait. Um, and one thing that like. When we first got there, my girl went through an orientation, and they took us to like this market. Um, everybody was like going crazy, buying things, getting kind of tattoos, and, and I didn't have any money on me. And I was just like, I can't participate because like there's, I have to wait for this refund to hit. And it hit like mm, like a good two weeks into it. But then I, I guess. Mm, and we want to try to avoid that. So yeah. in, in general, we want to try to get you enough money that when you get there, you're starting off. So that's one thing. Another thing that I didn't know about was there was demonetization in oh. India. Um, yeah. And so demonetization is they there were full of notes, the five hundred dollar or five hundred rupee note and the the thousand rupee note um, were no longer going to be in circulation, and they replaced them as new notes, a new five hundred a five hundred rupee note and a new two thousand rupee note. But um, this meant that there was like it was crazy to get cash because everybody, it, they, it, there just wasn't enough cash circulating and like we went to ATMs and there was, they were always empty. Um, everybody would form really long lines. You could be in the line for like two hours just waiting to like take cash out from the ATM. So um, it was pretty hectic the first couple of months until things started to settle down. And so when we took cash out, I made sure to take out large sums. Um, but some of them also had like, you could only take out so much because of the demonetization in it. And they had to make sure that everybody got a chance to like take some cash out. Um, so that's something. That and that was a really unusual political event. The new uh, prime minister just basically came in there and decided to do the whole money system completely different. And, and all the Indian locals who were also having trouble getting money. Yes. Money yeah. Yeah. So not just. Hopefully that won't happen. To you. <laughs> yeah. So that was, I guess, very particular to like my city, my study abroad. Um, another thing was, I have Bank of America, and my car didn't work with a lot of ATMs. So it, it was really difficult, because it was always just like a guessing game. I'd go up to an ATM and be like, please, please work. Um, I don't know if there's a way to get around that, to check like whatever bank you're with, to see what banks in that country you can withdraw from. Um, yeah, I, I use the one that I always worked in job international. Was it like a car with a chip? Because I know now most do, but like there wasn't enough time that like most American banks didn't have it. Uh, mine has a, mine has a chip, yeah. But it didn't still. Uh, no, and there were like 
the good thing is sometimes the ATMs were like, the banks were like right next to each other, so I just like, oh, don't work here. So I'd go walk them to buy some silver and try the other ATM. Um, I think that's a really good point that she made. And it happens in a lot of countries that it's, it's random. Some ATMs work and sometimes there's a symbol on there that allows you, sometimes you don't know why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and in places like Japan, for some reason you could go to a, an ATM type thing in the 7-Eleven and it always worked. <laughs> so, and there's some little tricky things there. Um, and then one thing, so I was a home stay student. I was one or one of four home stay students. So I lived, I was the closest one to the university, five minutes away. Um, and the thing was, so like in India, public transportation, I mean, it, it exists. I was just never brave enough to like venture out and try to figure out these bus systems. It just didn't make any sense to me. So I just kind of always used a rickshaw. And those costs also vary. So we all, it was always like 10 rupees. Um, sometimes they try to get more out of you, but I was like, no, it's 10 rupees to the university. And that's a very small note. And sometimes I only had $500 rupees. And I was just like, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, so making sure you have small cash on you, I think is important. And um, my host mom was actually really nice. And at the beginning of the semester, she's just like, here, you're going to need this. And just gave me a whole bunch of coins. And uh, that really helped out. I didn't have to worry a lot about, okay, so my pro, I did the program through CIEE, and um, so when you're looking at programs, investigate, like do a lot of research on the provider that you're going through, because they can offer a lot of things. So in India, my program through CIEE, there were 10 students, but then there were like a couple of five students who made up the study abroad program at my university, the University of Hyderabad. Um, I, I don't remember what the acronyms were or anything, but my program out of all of them, I feel like, were uh, the most like prepared to help us. And so we got a stipend that I didn't even know about, uh, 3,000 rupees to spend on like clothes. And that was when, we, that they, when they told us, like, oh, we're going shopping for clothes. We were like, oh, okay. They're like, everybody's getting 3,000 rupees. And we're like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really nice. They also provided a phone for us. Um, there's a deposit right now that we have to give on the phone, and we got a bike because our campus was huge, and I had to bike from where the rickshaw dropped me, dropped me off all the way to South Campus, which was like a 15-minute bike. But anyway, so they gave all of that to us, and those deposits were refundable. I mean, yeah, yeah, we got them at the end of the semester. But I guess um, knowing that, making sure you look into like everything that you provide. Um, and uh, they were also really understanding. Like I told them at the beginning, I was like, I don't have money yet. Um, they work with you. And they also provided like classes that were cultural classes. So I got to take a henna art class um, and a yoga class that was paid for by them. Um, and other students couldn't do that. So that's something that they were a little jealous about because CIE provided these things outside of what is covered like for classes like tuition and stuff. Um, and they also have like excursions outside. So they took us on an, our first trip to Humpy was all covered through them. And so they take you to places too. Um, so I don't know, is that the sign? It's outside of what you have to pay because that's already part of what you pay for the large stuff that's going to CIE at the beginning. Yeah, so all that's covered. Um, what else? Um, I have a question. Um, did you mention your health care or how that works? Like, it was expensive to find a doctor or go to a doctor or co pays? Like, because I know I was reimbursed in Hell in Berlin. I went to the doctor and it cost 40 euros. I had to pay up front and then I got reimbursed by the insurance. Mm -hmm. So did you experience anything involving that at all? I, I never had to go to the doctor. Um, so I, okay. yeah, yeah. Which I was actually kind of like scared about because you know, they're like, don't, don't drink the water, and be careful with like ice, and um, don't drink the meal bottles. I mean, don't eat from like street vendors or things like that. But they have a doctor the CIE had a doctor that they worked with, um, and they came in and they gave us like a good debriefing on like how to stay safe, like uh, health-wise, and um, 
everything, and then she was going to be like our, our doctor specific to us. Um, Melissa's question is good because in overseas, in most countries, I think with the insurance that we provide, you may have to pay up front for just the basic costs, you know, routine things, or if you're just feeling a little sick, you might have to pay up front cash, keep a receipt, and then submit a claim form, very American style, I always call it. Now, if you have something bigger, I've had students end up in the hospital, then um, the advisors open up a case with the insurance company and then we make it so that they're paid directly so you don't have to deal with big sums. But for smaller sums, it is a, it can be an upfront cost that you should be aware of. So that's the point. Yeah, and I know like, with the definition of big and small is, for example, when I was my first week in Germany, I couldn't walk in my right leg for some reason for a couple days, so I went to the doctor and they cast to it up and that cost 180 euros. And I did submit it, but that was a couple days of me not having 180 euros, which could make the bank make or break the bank or something. Yeah, that's a lot. So it was, it was a very odd situation, and my leg killed normally after, so. And uh, so I was also in India, so compared to here, everything was pretty cheap. Um, so your dollar, like, can be used for more things than you would here or in Europe. Um, so I never felt, I didn't feel that, like, a strong, like I go out to eat, I could get a meal for 35 rupees, um, which, I mean, Approximately how much is that now? Five dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty, pretty cheap. Um, but so then compared to like so CIE, there were those of us who were uh, home state students who got a lot covered. I mean, like I had a room. I didn't have to worry about like cleaning anything um, because my home state mom had a maid. Like. She took care of everything. Um, the only thing was like getting to and from the university. They always fed me. That's another thing. Like even though I was only supposed to get two meals a day, whenever I was there, I'd get meals. Like if I was at my house the whole day, I'd get three meals. And I thought they were gonna be very like specific on that. Like you only get two meals because that's the paid for for them. Um, maybe that's a, is dependent. <laughs> on, like, but in in any thing to like uh, you treat your guests. Like, like if it were God, you, you would accept God in your house and you would treat them in that fashion, yeah. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but then compared to like those who were in the dorm, they really hated the meal plan. Like, hated the meal plan. And so even though that's something that is covered by what you're paying, they still ended up spending a lot of money going out and like exploring all these different restaurants and um, yeah, so it was, I guess, they ended up spending more than what they thought was, and they can't get, they couldn't get a refund for their meal plan, um, which was another thing. I paid for a meal plan, actually, just to get lunch. Um, that's also very tricky, because there wasn't, like, anything I signed. I just kind of talked to uh, the person in charge of the dorm, and I was just like, hey, I'd like lunch. And he's like, okay, sure. He's like, give me this much. And I gave him that much, and that, like, there wasn't really like anything that specified when I could get to him, when I couldn't. And then like at the beginning he had promised me like if I ever had to be on campus early or late that I would get breakfast and dinner. He didn't hold up on that. But um, I don't know, so maybe make sure any deals you make are in writing so that you don't get charged more than what it should be. Um, even though, I mean, it didn't, it wasn't a lot in the long run like looking at it and dollars, but back then, uh, when I was there, I was really upset that he had said something and like he didn't hold up to mm -hmm. it. Um, what else? Yeah, any questions? I don't know if I'm going to get with you. That's a lot of helpful information. <laughs> and Charlotte, did Charlotte please? Yeah, um, hi, my name's Charlotte. You want to um, come up front? Or? Sure, I don't really have like a prepared speech. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, you don't have to, but you could just tell briefly about your experience yeah. in the summer program. And, and you got a Gilman scholarship. Yes. You can talk about how you got a Gilman scholarship, which we have like a... Here. Gilman, you'll want to pick up one of these on your way up. Can I have enough? Yeah. Okay. Hi. So, um, so I guess I'll just give you like a little overview of what I did and then open it up to questions because I don't have a ton prepared, but I did get a Gilman scholarship to go to Quito Ecuador this summer. So that was the 13th program. 
Um, we spent about three and a half weeks doing a homestay in the city of Quito and taking classes at um, University of San Francisco in Ecuador. And then we spent a week in the Galapagos and a week in the Ecuadorian Amazon. So that was really amazing. Um, what did you have to do to get your Gilman? What was okay, the application so like? You have to be a Pell Grant recipient. That's one of the um, requirements. And then the application looked like uh, two essays. One of them was kind of a personal statement about like why you want to go, what your interests are, how your interests align with the program that you want to do. And then the second one was proposing a follow-on project that you would do within six months of returning. This is part of the follow-on project where I'm speaking about my experience um, and how it helped me, how the Gilman Scholarship helped me go to Ecuador. Um, so yeah, that's the project proposal aspect. Um, and did the scholarship cover your whole no. summer? It covered about half the cost of the program. So I'm not sure exactly how the Gilman <laughs> decides how much money to give you. I think it's based upon the time that you're going and your need. Um, but yeah, with the contribution that the Gilman made, I was able to cover the rest of it. Have any questions? I can also like write my email on the board if anybody wants more information about the application process. It was actually relatively easy. They were super generous. How much does the program cost? The Quito program, I think. Um, there are two. So there's Nature and Culture, which is the one that includes the Galapagos, and then there's the other one is called Race and Racism. Um, I think that's the name of it. And that one goes to um, a different part of Ecuador, a different region, while the other group goes to the Galapagos. So our program, I think, was between ten and eleven thousand dollars, and my Gilman scholarship was a little over four thousand. What was the application due? A great question. It was uh, spring semester, so I went in. I left in. <laughs> I think I left at the end of June and got back in July, um, and I think that I applied to the Gilman maybe in February and heard back in April, I would say. That's like around, I know that it was very much second semester. Yeah. Were there any like surprise costs that were specific to the war, or things you didn't think you have to pay for study about the end of the war, things like that? Um, I think what, uh, sorry, remind me of your name. Danielle. Danielle was mentioning before about being on a meal plan and really hating the food was kind of true um, about the meal plan at my school. So I definitely spent more money than I anticipated eating out just because <coughs> the food was pretty intolerable sometimes. Not to mention, like if you have, if you live with a host family, you guys kind of dive into the local food. I studied abroad in Spain, and my host mom was an amazing cook. So it was pretty good. Yeah, I think it kind of just depends on your family too. My mom yeah. was also a great cook, but she got up at 4.30 in the morning to work every day, so I was kind of on my own for food, and she just like kind of left me to my own devices, which I actually love because I like cooking, but I think it really is just dependent upon your homestead. Charlotte, for summer program, did you have to worry about cell phone costs or anything? What, what did most students do? That was included within the program, so they ended up giving us Georgetown arranged to give us each a chip that we were able to a SIM card to put in our phone. So that worked. Um, I know people ran out of data in my program and ended up having to pay extra, but it wasn't a huge problem. Wi-Fi was pretty accessible, and again, I think that might just be specific to the program that I did. Would it be helpful if I wrote my email on the board? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Danielle, if you want to write your I think I also want to say something about India. So, in India, I think the costs that you spend on like, things like this and clothes and, um, can vary on how good of a uh, how good how good you are at bartering. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. some people just like, pay whatever, but you could get down your cost of whatever. Like at the market, because everything is like they give you a, like a drill, they give you an amount, and they're like, no, 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 and you walk away, and then they got something. So that's very true. I, I didn't think I was going to go through it, and I, I think I kind of sucked. Um, but um, some people got like shoes for like 30 rupees. I just had the experience of it. We're down here bartering, bartering skills, um, and you can definitely get things for cheaper. And there are definitely cultural um, and 
for lack of a better word, things that you have to be aware of in terms of not bringing the prices down too low so that the people that you're buying from are not benefiting, but usually people that are there within the program are willing to help you with that and make sure that you don't take advantage of any fun. And something else I forgot to mention, um, tipping, if you look at the tipping customs in the country that you're going to, um, and the places where I studied Paris, Berlin, and Bordeaux, it's not customary to tip, but it's optional to. Um, and I, I don't know, if, I think the is like country, though, tipping is kind of required to sustain the workers minimum wage, right? So, it's <coughs> to see if it's expected or it's kind of expected to do so. So, if there's no more questions, um, we'll have the scholarship documents up here. Um, I'm leaving my business card out, like I said, I work in the financial aid office and I'm the director of the consent, so if you questions about any of those things, if you didn't get a handout, um, write your name on that listserv that was going around, so if you can find that again, um, and we'll email that out after. Uh, we have the two events coming up, like I said, uh, funding unpaid internships on the 1st, and dress to the on the budget on the 9th. Uh, please take some sandwiches and drinks. Thank you.